Greetings. Welcome to another Fireside Chat brought to you by the 150th Anniversary Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. My name is Harry Hafer. This Fireside Chat celebrates the fortitude our founders had in establishing a liberal free religion in Lincoln, Nebraska, from its earliest days of Nebraska's founding and the continuing dedication members had in keeping a physical presence on Lincoln through good and hard times. It covers the years 1870 to 1961. Part two, covering 1961 to the present, will be posted on the church's website in the near future. Out of wood and stone, out of dreams and sacrifice, the people build a home. Out of the work of their hands and hearts and minds, the people fashion a symbol and a reality. In the beginning, a mere three years after Nebraska was granted statehood in 1867, and just two years after the end of the Civil War, a small group of liberals meeting at the home of Mrs. Mary Monell and her husband organized the Universalist Society on September 1, 1870. There were only around 350 buildings in the community at the time, and the Burlington Northern Railroad and Telegraph Service had just reached Lincoln. This small group of liberals took advantage of an 1868 ruling by the commissioners whom set apart one-fourth of a block, or three lots, for each Christian denomination who would erect a church building thereon. The cornerstone of the chapel was laid on October 21, 1871, on the lots provided to the Universalists on the northwest corner of 12th and H. As written in the local newspaper at the time, the Nebraska Intelligencer, the laying of the cornerstone of the Universalist Chapel in this place on Saturday, 3 p.m., October 21st, 1871, was an event full of interest and significance to the friends of the enterprise and of enjoyment to all who participated in the exercises. Reverend James Gorton, the pastor, conducted the exercise and gave words of counsel and encouragement, stating, In the laying of the cornerstone, there is to us a deeper significance than is felt by the casual observer. It is the cornerstone of the first Universalist Church in the state of Nebraska. It is, too, to us an historic event, for the organization of a little band of seven was formed last year, in the centenary year, as a centenary offering, and only completed and placed on the record the last day of the year. And now in this year, the first year of the second century of Universalism in America, when our denomination is just crystallizing into a unity of purpose heretofore unknown, the permanent work here has commenced. We have begun the building of the material temple and the building of the spiritual temple. And while we need a solid foundation for the material temple, we need also a solid foundation for the spiritual temple, the temple of character, a foundation of truth and love and goodness and faith in, and life in, all things noble and pure. On Sunday, June 23, 1872, the Universalist Church was dedicated and Lincoln's population had reached nearly 2,500. During the 1870s and 1880s, the Universalist Society flourished and steadily grew from its original founding membership of seven to nearly 30 by around 1880, with Lincoln's population growing to 13,000. By the early 1890s, Lincoln's population had ballooned to just over 55,000, leading to growth in the church as well. More space was needed. The members took their first major step in supporting the future of liberal religion in Lincoln by replacing the Universalist Chapel in 1892 on the same lot by a much larger red sandstone building at a cost of $20,000 equivalent to approximately $580,000 in 2020. It was dedicated in 1893. The average annual salary in 1892 was $637 for men and $122 for wives. However, because of the financial crisis of the 1890s and a drop in Lincoln's population from 55,000 in 1890 to just over 40,000 in 1900, the Universalists struggled to keep the church going. The construction of the new building left the church heavily in debt. Aid from the American Unitarian Association was finally obtained, and on May 20, 1898, without a dissenting vote, the Universalist Society of Lincoln was dissolved, and on May 27, 1898, All Souls Unitarian Church was formed with a charter membership of 97. 
quoting member Ira Hatfield. On May 27, 1898, a meeting of all those interested was held pursuant to a public call, and All Souls Church was formed. Negotiations were opened with the American Unitarian Association, and arrangements were made to remove the difficulties that had crushed the Universalist society, and the foundation laid for a successful church. Practically every one of those connected with the Universalist Church afterwards became identified with All Souls Church, and there has never been any friction or denominational jealousy. The new church is flourishing and grows steadily in all elements of strength. By 1908, membership had grown from 97 charter members to 185 names in the membership book. This majestic building served the All Souls Unitarian Church well for over 60 years. Various renovations and improvements were made over the years, including in 1920 an addition of a pipe organ costing $2,000, equivalent to about $26,000 today. In 1922, the seats were rearranged to make a center aisle and new carpet was laid. Later, the entertainment room in the basement was renovated. In addition, during the summer of 1921, a seven-room parsonage was built on a lot purchased by a handful of members. On December 11, 1930, a dedication of Elizabeth Dolan's ornamental fresco painting titled The Search for Truth was installed on the blank wall behind the pulpit. Elizabeth Dolan was once considered one of the finest fresco painters in the U.S. There are also murals of hers in the State Capitol, Morrow Hall, and nine in Lincoln's Masonic Temple. Many others are found in galleries and private collections. There was also a need for extensive improvements to the basement to enlarge the dining room, cut a new entrance to the basement, make three new classrooms, and renovate the kitchen, keeping, however, the old stove and water heater in the interest of nostalgia and economy. The rotting wood floor in the basement needed to be replaced, and the bathrooms had much to be desired as well. The women's at least had a sink, and while the men's apparently appeared to be in a storage room, it also included a shovel. All of this was to be accomplished for an estimated $12,500, around $135,000 today. By 1951, Lincoln's population was nearing 99,000. The church's weekly newsletter, called The Unitarian, for the week of November 23rd through December 1st, 1951, announced that immediately after the services next Sunday morning, December 2, there will be a business meeting of the parish at which proposed amendments to the Constitution and bylaws of the Church will be considered for adoption. The following week's newsletter notes somewhat unceremoniously that at the Congregational meeting last Sunday, a new charter and new bylaws were formally adopted, and that was in the official name of the Church. Instead of being All Souls Unitarian Church, the new name is now simply the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, Nebraska. While the masthead of the weekly newsletter stayed the same, the name change is noted on the back of the newsletter. Perhaps somewhere in the records is discussion as to why the congregation voted to change its name. In 1956, the planning committee reported many defects that needed attention, including deflected roof trusses, antique wiring, need for plastering and painting, windows rotted and inoperative, a roof that must be replaced, and other miscellaneous items. The total cost was estimated at $25,000, equal to about $240,000 today. This is all without adding any additional space for church activities. Due to these findings, the committee recommended that only minimum and emergency repairs be made and that the membership authorize an immediate campaign to raise sufficient funds to purchase a site for the future construction of a new church building. The congregation voted to authorize the planning committee to consult with an architect and to investigate possible sites. After carefully considering several smaller locations, the committee recommended the site at 63rd and A Streets which was chosen by a congregational vote of 55 to 9 in May 1957. At this time, the 2.6-acre tract was on the edge of town, out in the cornfields. Looking north and east toward 70th was a field of corn with the Veterans Hospital in the distance. To the north was the beginning of housing. Dale Gibbs was the architect chosen to work with the congregation, and in November 1959, he was authorized to proceed with working drawings. It was proposed the church be built in two stages. The first would include an all-purpose room, a lobby, which became the fireplace room, today referred to as the gallery space, a religious education wing, and some office space and kitchen facilities. The second stage would include a large auditorium and courtyard north of the all-purpose room. The original design won an award from the National Church Architectural Guild. The congregation didn't feel they could afford everything in the working drawings, 
and voted to only build the main center structure and use the all-purpose room for services planning to build a large auditorium at some point in the future. A contract was signed with the builder for approximately $130,000, equivalent to around $1,143,000 today, to be financed by pledges from a capital funds drive, sale of the church property on 8th Street, borrowing from the American Unitarian Association and the Iowa Unitarian Association, and the sale of bonds to church members. A groundbreaking service for the new church was held on June 5, 1960. Two people, Sarah Deutsch, a member of the Unitarian Society, organized in 1891, and Maud Hatfield, a charter member of the All Souls Church when it was organized in 1898, were part of the ceremony. The cornerstone was laid on a cold winter day, December 11, 1960. The Reverend Peter Rabel, the ninth minister of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, commented, Dear unknown successor, we wonder what the Lincoln of your day will look like. Undoubtedly, it will differ from our time as much as our present city differs from the Lincoln of 1892, when the cornerstone of our present church was set into place. At present, our new church site embraces the last land within the eastern city limits. The prairie stretches on unbroken to the east. The 1960 census reveals approximately 128,000 people living within the city. The laying of the cornerstone has rich meaning to us, for this is the first building ever erected by the present church organization. The present church was inherited from the Universalists, and much of the fascinating history of this earlier liberal church will be found at the State Historical Society. From earliest beginnings, the Unitarian faith, under whatever name, has been characterized as a progressive, changing religion. We expect your ideas, methods, and beliefs will differ from our own. You will see clearly our inadequacies and correct our mistakes. We dare predict, however, that your religion will continue to hold a central concern about man's life here on this earth. I also venture to guess that in coming generations, growing numbers of men will find free religion a place for their allegiance. Our church will give opinion for life-affirming faith to not just a small minority of Americans, but vast numbers of individuals, not only in this country, but around the world. Across the years, we salute you of our future church and pray that you shall have a courage and conviction worthy and sufficient to meet the tasks of your time. The old building on 12th and H was sold to Pioneer Housing Corporation. It was later demolished and an apartment building for senior citizens still stands on the site. The red sandstone building served the All Souls Unitarian Church for some 63 years, from 1898 to 1961. Tom Carroll expressed the feeling of many members when he wrote, Finally, we left forever our church home, our home where so many had spent their childhoods, matured, married, and brought their children. Physically, it was an old stack of hand-chipped red bricks, cracked plaster, aging plumbing, and curious architecture of another day. But spiritually, it was a place of beautiful memories. We left it with a mixture of sadness and hope for the future. At the last service given at 12th and H on June 4, 1961, current member Denise Dickinson's father, Roger Dickinson, spoke. And in the year 1991, they will tell of this time, they will tell of the summer of 61 when the little congregation left its home of 60 some years at 12th and H Street. When they left a home filled with memories of tears, much laughter and love, such tender love. Yet in the summer of 1961, they left forever the old home where their children had grown to adulthood, married, brought their children, where they sat full of grief while words were spoken for a dear one now gone, where they had worshiped with a method and intensity not well understood by the community. We are grateful to those who gave of their substance and their lives that this congregation might persist in the past. We are grateful to those who gave and who are giving of their savings of a lifetime and their wages 
to enable us to buy the land and start a new building. In making this move, we have assumed a burden of debt, some $60,000, that must be paid in the decade ahead. It is a substantial debt, and we are full of anxieties regarding it. In the quiet moment of this Sunday morning, we may ask ourselves, what have we done? Were we right to place this load on the backs of ourselves and those who will come with us? Yes, we were right. This same question has been asked by this congregation at many points in its history and answered affirmatively. The lesson of our history teaches us the courage we now feel, and we are confident that this congregation is now taking a giant stride forward toward an increasing meaningfulness for this community and its members. We are confident that with our new building and Mr. Stephen, our new minister, we shall commence the writing of a new and dynamic page of our congregational history. The first service in the new church was held on October 1, 1961, with newly hired minister Charles S. Stephen, Jr. Records show there were 234 members and 144 youth enrolled in the religious education program. And even with the new building, there was still a problem with too little space in the religious education program. In each generation of the church, there have been difficult times. And in our church and in Unitarian Universalism broadly, people of faith have risen to meet the challenge of those times. Mm -hmm. 